Acharam is unmoving, Charam is moving. In unmoving objects as well as in moving objects, his inside and then outside. And then, Sukshmatva Tat Avignayam. Because he is very subtle to know, because he is so subtle to know, he appears to be very, very far away when in fact he is very, very near. So another dimension of the same ultimate reality, another dimension. Avibhaktam cha bhuteshu vibhaktam ivachastitam. That is, you saw the picture in which millions of pilgrims were going behind a god who was taken in procession. You saw that picture. Millions of individuals just going on the road behind the deity who was being taken in procession. You saw that picture. And... So the sutra says, avibhaktam cha bhuteshu, that is undivided in all creatures. Bhutaha are forms, living forms, bhuteshu in all the creatures. Vibhaktam ivachastitam, even though he is completely undivided. He is the same life of your life, the essence in every living and non-living form. But the forms appear so numerous, appear infinite in number. But the life essence is the one and the same in every living form, living as well as non-living. The life essence is the same. So, avibhaktam cha bhuteshu, vibhaktam ivachastitam, bhuta bhartra cha tatnyayam, grasishnu prabhavishnu cha. So, he is the husband. He preserves you. He protects you. So, this is the object to be known. So, he protects all creatures. Grasishnu prabhavishnu cha. That is, he devours you finally. He creates you and finally he devours you also. This is the God who is the preserver, who is the creator and he is the destroyer all in one. Not three gods. Not Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara. Brahma doing creation, Vishnu doing preservation, Shiva doing destruction. All the three are one only. The same primordial intelligence the ultimate reality, the Paramatma, he is doing all three functions. He is creating, he is preserving, he is destroying. Just remember your teeth and you will get the devotion. <laughs> Just dwell on your teeth and your intestines, that's enough for you. <laughs> what is to be known, Nyayam, is Parabrahma, is one indivisible whole Yet because of the sensory perception, he seems to dwell in all beings as if divided into many. This is the catch. The maya, the senses are creating. As though there are so many separate living forms, when in essence there is only one. Only one essence. But it just divided itself and created this plurality. But the life essence is one only, appearing as many. He is the protector, the destroyer, as well as the originator of all beings. So as you study uh, this divinity and as you study this God, like uh, a biologist may study some microbes or uh, an astronaut may go to the moon or he may send a spaceship to Mars, like how you do all that work, like uh, the artist lady will choreograph various dances, how you put your heart and soul into the whole thing and you study it deeply. In the same way, you've got to study this divinity and then you'll find that you'll find uh, a shocking thing that you are actually the divinity, but you are prevented from knowing it by the veil of Maya. You're prevented from knowing that. So this is the hill which is worshipped in India by devotees of Bhagavan Ramana as Shiva and the destination of life, the Samam Bonam of life, you got to get there. And that hill is a pointer to us that inside us there is an unmoving stillness, a sea of stillness, endless, timeless, birthless, without any end. And that is the... So when you circumambulate around the Arunachala hill in Thruvannamalai, like devotees of Bhagavan Ramana do, that act of circumambulation going around the hill is a reminder so that you can contemplate on the imperceptible inner self of the Atma which has to be the Samambonam of life. 
so that all along the pilgrimage, as you keep circumambulating, about 12 kilometers or something, you go around, you are, you are in, in manana and in nididhyasana. You heard the teaching from that Bhagavan Ramana, which is Atma Vichara, inquire as to who you are. And so, as you're walking around the hill for hours together, several hours together, you've got to be contemplating on the truth. That's the pilgrimage for, to contemplate on that. So, it's, it's not a seeming physical act. It's got more to it. It's an inward journey. And that's the time for you to actually do that inward journey. So this is, uh, 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 this is called Meenakshi is another name in uh, the Hindu religion for Shakti, the Divine Mother. And her headquarters is in Madurai in South India. In Madurai there is a temple called Meenakshi Temple. That is her uh, kind of highest abode. And uh, this is a um, this is the Hindu god, Vishnu, blue in color. And this person who has got the antelope on the tip of his finger, he is Shiva Mahadeva, the great god. Beyond him, there is nothing. He is the ultimate. He is the father in heaven. And Vishnu is handing over his sister, who is Shakti, to Shiva in marriage. What does the marriage mean? That's the conundrum. It's not a man and woman getting married. Obviously not. Obviously not. What does it mean now? That's, that, that's something for you to ponder over. Got to understand. The, the mythology teaches in symbols. It teaches in pictures. And in the picture and in the mythic image there's a teaching. Make that sharper. You're getting close, but that's exactly not it. I want a better answer. A union. A union, right. You already saw that picture, Shakti sitting on Shiva's lap. This is another portraiture of the same truth. Surrendering. Surrendering, yeah. Shakti coming back, renouncing her mad activity. She's so tired, she wants to go to sleep now. <laughs> And so this marriage is actually Shakti going to sleep. She's so tired. <laughs> <laughs> but why is Vishnu is over there also? Pardon? Why is Vishnu in there as a creator? Yeah, good question. Good question. So the Hindus have got, uh, the Hindus have got, uh, like, in the, like in modern science, uh, whatever you are studying in modern science, there are a number of competing theories and perceptions of anything, for example, if you take, uh, uh, if you take light or if you take heat, uh, in the early stages, in the sciences of the previous century, there were many theories of heat, many theories of light. Finally, they will, one of the theories will uh, fall down because of mistakes and errors, and one theory will come out as the, as the final theory. And Vishnu uh, is an aspect of the divine perceived in a different framework, Perhaps I can conduct a retreat, the same retreat in self-realization, in the Vaishnava Sampradaya, not in the Shiva Shakti Sampradaya. Now I've used the metaphor of Shiva and Shakti uh, to teach Atma Jnana and self-realization. Then one can also approach self-realization and Atma Jnana through the Vaishnavite framework, Vishnu, basing on Vishnu. Now, Vishnu is actually something like Shakti. So, but it's an independent darshana, an independent way of understanding the divine, and having a God-centered perception of life. So now, with, now, these are two independent perceptions. It's like two languages, Spanish and English, two completely different languages. Now, when you translate, you've got to find a counterpart for a certain word, which is very close. So, in the Vaishnavite tradition, the god Vishnu plays a role which is very akin to the role played by Shakti in the, in, the, in the Shaiva or the Shiva philosophy of life. So, it's a translation between like English to Spanish or Spanish to English. We are going from a Vaishnavite framework to a Shaivite framework. 
And Vishnu has the role of something like Shakti in that framework. So Vishnu becomes the family person who hands over his sister to Shiva. And, and, and the Hindus in one way are a little funny uh, because they want to think of all these cosmic life energies and transcendental incomprehensible mysteries of life in very anthropomorphic down-to-earth terms. So to make it understand to very gross people, they say Vishnu is the brother-in-law of Shiva. <laughs> oh my God. They just murdered the truth. I feel so sad. If we're very gross people to get it. <laughs> then they say, Vishnu is the brother-in-law of Shiva. Then, okay, all fools are saying, oh yes, the, now, the, now we understand, yes. <laughs> so I'm trying to convey something which is little uh, foreign to your uh, culture. But the point I'm driving at is that uh, uh, they're, they're portraying the same theme and the same truth in so many different ways. Because um, it's not the same author who's doing it. Every time a person realizes and he conveys the truth, he conveys it in a slightly different form from his fresh understanding. And therefore the truth takes on a new color, a new picture. So this is again uh, Shakti coming back to uh, uh, Shiva. So you can just read this small uh, few words here. And if you want to see the thousand faces of God and the thousand manifestations of God, then you must actually undertake a very leisurely pilgrimage in India, a spiritual pilgrimage. That should not be hurried. That should not be for one week or two weeks. It should probably be for six months. And you've got to prepare for that pilgrimage for two years. Yeah, because there is so much to understand. Two years, you will actually study everything. The history and everything. And two years, you will also do atmic work and get ready for the pilgrimage. Then you understand what this whole culture is about. It was obsessed with understanding and going home to the ultimate reality. Like in the Western world, you are completely obsessed with understanding nature, conquering nature, and getting that mastery over nature. So that nature will work for you, whatever you want the motor cars, the technology, the engines. It's all nature. You have harnessed and subdued nature. How many guts are, how many images are there? Countless. Countless. Countless temples, countless manifestations of God. Because every time a human being makes contact with the divine, he understands, he gets a new revelation. And then he presents it in a book or if he's an artist in art form, or if he's a musician, he puts it in, he sings, starts singing. And if he's a sculptor, then he starts sculpturing. So innumerable manifestations. And some of the best works on uh, uh, Hindu, for example, religious art, are by Western authors who have taken very deep interest in studying it. Yeah, taken time and devoted themselves fully in exploring Now look at another perception. <laughs> the same truth again and again and again. Why are you people capturing all these in pictures? <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to understand and nothing is necessary beyond that. <laughs> Okay, okay. 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 Now, for example, around this deity in the outskirts of Chennai, this is an avatar of Vishnu called the Boar Incarnation. One of the avatars of Vishnu, the great god Vishnu in the Vaishnava framework. And he is supposed, now it's wrongly understood that he's supposed to have married 
365 damsels. It's a distortion of the truth. So the inner meaning is, every day Shakti comes back home to take rest. She is not so excited and so delirious that she comes home once in six months. No. Every day, she is very limited in her restlessness. Every day she comes home to her Lord to take refuge. So that is the state of the Sthita Prajna. The Shakti works in him and then immediately he is back to Shiva. So this is another mythic portraiture of the same truth. And uh, there are two more sitting in the on the feet. Yeah. A very small, like a baby. Yeah, a, a god and uh, uh, a god and a deity actually. Uh, she's the consort of this god, and uh, this. Uh, Yeah, he also seems to be having the serpent hoods on top of him. He is uh, another aspect of the god Vishnu. And from him may have emerged this particular manifestation called Varaha Murti, bore incarnation. So in, in creative ways, that is, uh, there are no rigid rules made that you must conceive of God only in this way. So an artist is given full freedom of expression to describe the truth which he has realized in artistic terms, in mythic terms, full freedom. And that's the beauty. So the culture is very, very, very rich because it's not uh, kind of uh, got a rigidified approach to ultimate reality, saying this alone is the path, thou shalt walk only on this path, every other path is forbidden, none of that kind. Diverse paths for diverse people. So we have seen this already. And now look at this. Now this is in the Vaishnavite framework. And here, in the, if you read the Vishnu Purana, there is a sacred text like the Bhagavad Gita. There, is a, there are 18 Puranas and there is Vishnu Purana. In the Vishnu Purana, uh, this Mahavishnu takes the form of Maheshwara in the Shaiva tradition. And this is his Shakti. His Shakti which he has kind of subdued. It's completely under control. And then his Shakti is now, she has become a Dasi to her Lord. That is, she is pressing his feet out of devotion and affection. Given up her mad activity. Another portraiture? Yeah. Like I told you that in the Shaivite tradition, Ganesha is the eldest son of Shiva and Ganesha is the feeling of I amness. I mentioned that? Yes. Right. Now in the Vaishnavite tradition, the son of Vishnu is Brahma. And he is born to Vishnu and that's why you see this umbilical cord. This umbilical cord, which means he is born to him. So the same truth in different frameworks of philosophy, every framework of philosophy is like a model and a guiding light for you to explore into the truth yourself. So you can be a devotee of Vishnu, you can be a devotee of Shiva, depending on the family in which you are born, or if your intellectual delight is in Shiva, then shift to Shiva, if your intellectual passion is for Vishnu, shift to Vishnu and so on. Why is the, the uh, color of the skin like a blue or somehow? Oh, lovely question. This, the, lovely, this is my question, actually. <laughs> I got the answer to this question in 73. <laughs> so the moment I got uh, connected, then automatically the whole consciousness turned Godward. It starts wondering about God. It starts inquiring and wondering. And then the blue thing, I didn't read any book. I'm just wondering. Then it came home to me that the color blue his, uh, has been chosen for that God because this God is omniscient, he's omnipresent. So the whole sky is his body. And the sky is blue. And the oceans are blue. Therefore he's blue. So the Hindus are so creative in their conception of the divine. So creative. Limitless play of imagination. 
Because even if you give that limitless freedom in their imagination, you can't exhaust the richness of the divine in your portraiture. So I'm showing you different frameworks, how the divine is understood, how the divine is perceived, how the divine is worshipped. And if I get time sometimes, then maybe uh, I like to watch uh, um, 50 hours of Vishnu Purana with you with English subtitles. 50 hours. But you have to be prepared for that. Because in India, people are watching. People are kind of addicted to these uh, serials. They are 50 hours, 55 hours. And they, and they completely unfold the mystery and the wonder of God. They are made in Hindi or in Tamil but with subtitles. So that you can, even people who don't know the language can actually follow it. I can recommend some very good books uh, by German Indologists for you to study and ponder uh, if you are interested uh, in the religious art of Hinduism. Religious art. All art in India is inspired by religion. By the central truth that there is God, there is God, there is God, there is nothing else. And this is another portraiture. Now, the bull is the body, because the body is so dense like a bull. It's very stubborn in its appetites, it's very stupid, it's just like an animal. And in that body, Shiva is there. He is there. And beside him, also Shakti is there. Now, this is a good benevolent kind of Shakti who has come back and married her Lord. So, she is fit to raise a family. And now, this is their eldest son. This is I amness. In you, the I amness. This is the core of the human consciousness. The core of the human consciousness. And anybody who has got a strong Jupiter in their horoscope, they have got the full grace of Ganesha or their I amness. And Ganesha is worshipped in every temple. And because the I amness is the closest proximate thing to the father, Shiva Mahadeva, the father in heaven. Closest thing. So you may call that the soul if you wish. But so it is that, that Ganesha is, is dealing with the obstructions. You Be, because, because once you settle there, then obstructions go away. You've got to settle there. So the meaning of Ganesha being Vigneshwara, Vigna means obstruction. The Ishvara is the God who removes that obstruction. What is the meaning of the whole thing? The meaning is not to, rent to some, run to some Ganesha temple and worship him. That's the outer gross form. The inner thing is go in and settle there. Got it? Go in and settle into the I amness. Don't be I am this and don't be I am that. Then you're caught in the world. You're caught in Maya. But if you come and settle in the seat of I amness and be there, then many problems will get solved. No obstacles for you. Therefore, he is Vigneshwara. Vigna means obstacle. He is the Ishwara or the God who removes obstacles. How? By going and settling there. Little bit of thinking, little bit of contemplation, whole thing will become clear for you. That right now, the I amness is a little vague. Is a little vague, I amness? Is a little vague? Too much Shakti? <laughs> I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is in the Wallace University, they teach us to go inside. Mm. To go inside. Let me show you. See? See? No. Yeah. See? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they, teach you to, they teach us to go inside and see whatever there is. And we have to say that that is me. I am that. No? Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, to realize Ganesha inside, mm -hmm. we have to go beyond the I am that. Exactly, yeah. You've got, to, you've got to go to the core of the human consciousness, which is the eye center. That's the naked eye. Now, what you know is the eye in flight. The eye in movement you know very well. Because you are that eye in movement. 
Now this is the I, which is kind of the root foundation of the I in moment. It's the root thing. So it is the thing which did not change from the time you were a five-year-old girl and a five-year-old boy. It did not change. And you've got to get the hang of it. Then you know what Ganesha is. It must occur to you spontaneously.